What's up, deep thinkers? This is Robert Nelson from Existence First, and today I'm very excited to interview my friend Charles Amamiya. Charles is from uh, Fairfield, right? Yes. Okay, which is somewhat close to San Francisco. We originally met at a self-development uh, uh, sort of a seminar, right? And uh, so that's something that we both share, is this, uh, where we're both into, you know, overcoming self-limiting beliefs, pushing yourself, overcoming challenges. And so, you know, we've been friends on Facebook, and, and the reason that I got interested in interviewing you, uh, like we're going to do today, is because you posted something about uh, San Quentin Prison. And I didn't know it, but you actually were, you were at San Quentin at one point as an uh, inmate, correct? Correct. And... Uh, Somehow you made it through, you made it out, you're doing well, and, and you go back and speak to the, to the inmates there, and you motivate them to overcome their challenges and to make the most of their life and, and fulfill their potential. So I'm really interested to hear, hear your story. I'll give you a few minutes just to kind of recap it all and summarize it for, for us, and then I, I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of questions uh, to kind of pick apart this, what's the psychology of what's happening here, so... Go ahead, Charles. What's, Sounds good. How, how did this all happen? Let me start with some context around my relationship with the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation because it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. In the late 90s, I was arrested for a drug manufacturing related crime. Mm -hmm. I was convicted of possession of chemicals with intent to manufacture methamphetamine mm -hmm. for all the Breaking Bad fans out there. <laughs> And I got a two-year prison sentence. Mm -hmm. I was first incarcerated at San Quentin State Prison. Mm -hmm. Later, I was transferred to Folsom State Prison. Mm -hmm. And once I hit Folsom Prison, everything really imploded. My mom died. Oh, while you were in uh, Correct. custody, right? And three weeks after that, my wife left me. Mm -hmm. And I was really at the lowest point of my life. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, what is my purpose in this world? Mm -hmm. I just lost my mom and my wife, the two people who are closest to me mm -hmm. in this world. I had a high school diploma, no real education. I had no real world job skills. I was mm -hmm. in prison and I had a felony conviction. I wondered if I even had a purpose in this world. Mm -hmm. But it was really at that low point that life really kicked me in the butt and said, hey, I'm going to tell you your purpose right now, mm -hmm. which was initially okay, you need to use your skills and talents to do good things in life and not use them to commit crimes. Mm -hmm. Now, being in that drug business, I did learn a few good skills. I had good sales and <laughs> communication skills. Yeah. I had good marketing skills. Mm -hmm. And obviously, since I got busted, the skill I really needed to work on was risk management. <laughs> I like that term. Yeah, go, right. go ahead. So that was the first turning point for me, is really hitting rock bottom and thinking about, for the first time, what is my purpose in this world? I think that's a lot of people's problems. I think a lot of us go through life, and we don't contemplate our purpose, and we don't know what gives us the most meaning and purpose in our lives. Mm -hmm. The second turning point was when I actually got out of prison. And I was initially hopeful, but I faced a lot of discrimination. And mm -hmm. one day I was in this room waiting for a job interview, and I knew that I could get this job. I was mm -hmm. talking to a guy who was waiting with me, mm -hmm. and he said he just graduated from Penn State. After that conversation I had with that young man, I went to my interview and once again got shot down. The hiring manager initially wanted to give me the job, but when he found out about my criminal conviction, mm -hmm. he pulled the job offer. Mm -hmm. And I was really angry after that. I had been discriminated against a lot, but after talking to that Penn State guy, I knew I had to get a good education to get better jobs, but okay. I was afraid. I was afraid of stepping out of the comfort zone. I was afraid of the unknown. And I was still really angry at that business world for mm -hmm. discriminating against me. Mm -hmm. But this actually set the stage because that anger turned into motivation. And that's what made me realize the biggest lesson that life was teaching me, which was that those concrete and steel structures I was incarcerated in were not the worst prisons. The worst prisons were the ones that I had created in my own mind. Wow. It was a low self-esteem, the anger, the negativity, and the shame that caused me to go to prison and also 
held me back as I was trying to transform my life after getting out. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's, there's so much in there that uh, that I want to ask about. Is it uh, before I start with the question? Was there any other part of the story that you wanted to share, or, or maybe how did you get into um, the, the motivational speaking and visiting the prisons and 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 actually doing your your speeches and programs there? Great question. When I initially got out of prison, I thought that my only purpose in this world was to get a good education, get a good job, and redeem myself. Uh -huh. I thought once I did that, my life purpose is done, that's pretty much it. But as I got out, and I got a great education, I got my master's degree, I've worked in technology. Oh, What's your master's degree in? Instructional technologies. Okay. It's using computers and software and adult learning theory to help people learn new concepts okay. and technologies. The strange thing was I did everything that I thought society wanted me to do. I followed what I call the cookie cutter success template. I got out, got a great education, I've had a great career in tech. I'm actually doing my second technology contract at the California Department of Corrections where I was once incarcerated. Mm -hmm. But around 2014, something strange happened. I was still enjoying the writing aspect of my job and I enjoyed working with other people, but I really started to hate the nature of the work. It was really mundane, the mm -hmm. commute was really long, and I found that I wasn't really that happy. Mm -hmm. If we had a happiness scale and here's being in prison, <laughs> I was probably about here uh -huh. at this point, but I wasn't here, sure. which is where I thought I would be. Mm -hmm. And what I really figured out, and this was a huge epiphany, was that I was putting all of my self-esteem and self-worth in things outside of myself. Mm. I was looking for happiness in my job. I was looking for happiness in my house. I thought that once I buy a car and I buy a nice house and I go on vacation, mm -hmm. that I would be happy. And for some reason, I was not I was happier than I was, but I wasn't ultimately happy. Mm -hmm. But when I started doing the volunteer work, mm -hmm. then something strange happened. Mm -hmm. Then I was volunteering with a lot of other technology professionals and people in venture capital. Mm -hmm. And we went into these prisons to help these incarcerated men out. And I noticed that every time I went to those events, I just got happier and happier mm -hmm. and happier. And the happiness never decreased. Mm -hmm. So have you ever bought something and felt temporary happiness. Like you get sure. a, a new phone, you get that new jacket, and you feel happy for a few days, right. and then the happiness curve goes back to baseline. Mm -hmm. I noticed that when I did the volunteer work in prisons, there was no return to baseline. Every time mm -hmm. I did something, I got happier and happier. Mm -hmm. And eventually, after going to a lot of events, it kind of peaked, but it peaked here. Mm -hmm. So here's prison, here's life working in tech, and yeah. here was my level of happiness when I was doing volunteer work. Right. And I figured out this happened because now I didn't put my self-worth in a company, in a car, in a house, in an education, or in success at a technology company. Mm -hmm. Now my self-worth was coming from inside myself. Mm -hmm. It was coming from me doing something that's bigger than myself that was making the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I gotcha. It reminds me of, uh, I think it was a con commencement speech, but it was with Arnold Schwarzenegger, and he was telling this story of um, he went to, like, Special Olympics, and he was uh, helping these, these people do bench press, right? Um, kids with special needs. And um, he had them all line up in front of the bench press. The first one set, laid down, you know, did just 10 pounds on each side, very small, like did, did 10 reps. Next person in line, 10 reps. Next person in line, right? And they see all they they all tried out the bench press. Now the last person in line, he walked up and he was like shaking and he he didn't want to do it. But then he lied down and and he was too nervous. He said no, no, and he got up and like left or something, right? And then uh, and then Arnold said, you know, um, he said take off the plates or whatever, right? And then he had the kid do like uh, just the bar or something like that, and the kid was able to do it, right? And then and then he put on a. Uh, two smaller plates, right? And then the kid actually did that. Then he put on even more weight and the kid was like, more, more. And the kid started like bench pressing more. So this kid that started out being like too shy and, and intimidated to even bench press 
uh, you know, just the bar alone, finally was doing this heavy weight. And then Arnold, the whole point of that was Arnold was saying, I felt so happy afterwards. And he's like, he said, uh, he said, and I couldn't figure out why. I, I was asking myself, I didn't make millions of dollars doing a movie today. I didn't make... Uh, I didn't win, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Olympia today. I was like, you know, why? Why am I so happy? I didn't accomplish anything for myself. I just helped the uh, these people that needed the help. So, right. Have you seen um, any of these uh, inmates so far like benefit? Like, do you witness any turnarounds or do you witness any epiphanies um, happening in in the inmates as you're talking to them? Yes, definitely. And what is that? A lot like? of yeah. a lot of people think that these inmates aren't that bright they're really violent despicable people but mm -hmm. when you do volunteer work at prisons on a regular basis you'll see mm -hmm. that these guys are really creative and mm -hmm. if they had the same opportunities that people from higher socioeconomic classes had they mm -hmm. would probably be executives mm -hmm. leaders or just overall great employees so when we go in and do these workshops and business coaching and personal development classes with these guys I, we see a, a lot of personal development and a lot of change. I can see instant change. Just, mm -hmm. for example, someone will tell me their business plan, and I'll ask them a few questions. Okay, have you identified your market? How much money are you going to make at this price point? And I can hear the gears turn. Mm -hmm. and they'll ask me questions. Okay, how, how can I better present? How do I learn how to speak better? Mm -hmm. What's a good way for me to advertise this business when I get out? So I can see instant changes, but the biggest changes are the ones that you see when the guys actually get out of prison mm -hmm. and then start their own businesses or what I call start their lives. Because mm -hmm. not all of them are going to be able to start successful, profitable businesses all the time. Some mm -hmm. of them just get out and start working. Mm -hmm. So to see that these guys got out and now they've actually started you know, a business or that they're actually working and they're making money. Mm -hmm is really really satisfying mm -hmm. yeah I want to ask about your personal moment of, of that when you got out of, uh, of prison and then you were saying that you had that job interview and you're talking to that guy from Penn State and and uh, you were turned down for the job because of your background uh, and you had a lot of anger about that it sounded from the way you were describing it that you were able to what I would call transmute that energy take that you took that anger and then you use that as motivation to move forward, which is great. The, um, the, the transmute word I'm getting from an uh, uh, author I'm reading called Frederick Dodson, who writes a lot about energy, right? So if we, if we consider anger as like a type of energy or a form of energy, you, you pretty much um, transmuted that or you changed it into um, a, an energy that helped propel you forward, right? So can you say a little bit, because that, I mean, that's, that's a tough situation, I mean, because it's very, very easy. I see it all the time. When in people, you know, in my line of work, and, and the clients that I work with, where it's it's this fixation on, you know, oh, they're, you know, life is unfair to me, or, um, you know, just because I have this thing in my background doesn't mean I'm not a, a I'm not a bad person, and this, but it's this fixation on something that doesn't allow them to move forward. So how were you able to kind of unlock the brakes, so to speak, and and actually move forward instead of just spinning these wheels? Of, of you know uh, futile emotion how are you able to actually move forward and um, and and achieve things and yeah and change your situation yeah great question I get asked that a lot okay. so again it began with that incident where once again I didn't get a job after getting an offer because they found out about my criminal record mm -hmm. and I was really angry as angry at that company right. as angry at the business world as mm -hmm. angry at the system mm -hmm. And I did get stuck in what you mentioned earlier, which is that victim mentality, where I was blaming everyone except myself. Mm -hmm. And you could say that other people were in that mental prison of bias or discrimination by not hiring me. I could argue that. But the problem is, if I don't eventually take ownership of my actions, and I don't get out of that mental prison of anger and mm -hmm. negativity and futility, mm -hmm. then I'm going to stay right where I'm at. Mm -hmm. So after that Penn State guy told me, you know, that you really need to get a good education these days, something really clicked. 
And that made me think deeper about which mental prisons I was actually in. And that's when I really, really thought, wow, I'm really a mess right now. I think I have it together because I just almost got a job. But really, I've been in this prison of anger and negativity for a long time. And I've been blaming the system and other people. But I need to say, hey, I made some mistakes. I committed some crimes. And now that I'm not getting jobs because of those things, I need to figure out what I need to do to get out of those mental prisons. Mm -hmm. So I slowly started to get out of that mental prison negativity first. Mm -hmm. I got a good mentor, which I think is really important yeah. for personal development and mm -hmm. for people who are in prison. Being out of prison and not having a good mentor is really bad because in general, I think all of us are kind of the average of the the five people we hang out with the most. Mm -hmm. That's an old saying. Right. And when you're in prison, you have the worst mentors around because you're in prison right. with a lot of people who are committing crimes and in many cases aren't on the same personal development track as you are if you want to excel in life once you get out. Mm -hmm. So once I got the mentor and I got out of that mental prison of negativity, the next thing I worked on was the self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I was really loving and believing in myself mm -hmm. in a positive way. And just identifying these mental prisons requires a lot of mindfulness. Because as we were talking about earlier, so many of us are in these mental prisons of anger and negativity and low self-esteem and shame, mm -hmm. but we don't realize it. Mm -hmm. Because these are prisons that we can't see, touch, or right. smell. Yeah. So it was just being mindful and being fully present with my thoughts, emotions, and beliefs, and seeing that these beliefs I had are not accurate, that the world isn't out to get me, mm -hmm. the system isn't out to get me. There are bad people in the world, but the world's mostly good. Mm -hmm. There are bad people in the system, but the system's mostly good. And that mm -hmm. is what allowed me to do as you said earlier, and really go from those low energy levels of anger and negativity, you know, up to confidence, mm -hmm. and just taking baby steps. Mm -hmm. Just getting more confident as I took community college classes. Get, I got more confident when I got my AS degree in computer science. Mm -hmm. I got more confident when I got better jobs. I got more confident mm -hmm. when I got my graduate degree. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, it sounds like you took a very proactive stance, right? And yes. This is so, I mean, it's so common in, in self-help. You, you read it in all different variations. One variation would be, you know, Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where, um, you know, I think the first habit is be proactive. And he gives this example of like, you can either uh, see an event happening and then you respond just automatically to the event, or you can realize that in between stimulus and response, there is this uh, freedom called free will. Mm -hmm. And you can actually, when something happens, so you can choose your response. That's also sort of foundational piece of my existentialist philosophy right existentialism is a philosophy of freedom and of, of realizing that you can make whichever choice you want and then by making that choice you then define who you are you define your identity and in that way you create your identity so I think uh, there's something to be said here about the, the freedom right the perception of, of the freedom but um, but yeah I really want to come back to this, this idea of the, the the prison the mental prison which as we said is invisible and I really wonder because I see I still see people caught in that. Is it possible for everyone to to escape the mental prison, or are some people doomed <laughs> just because of limited insight? Or do you think they're doomed forever to do that, or how do you know when someone is capable of doing that? That is a great question, and especially from a coaching perspective, because <laughs> both of us do life and business coaching. That is a big challenge. The short answer is I think that everyone is capable of escaping from a mental prison. But unfortunately, the reality is that not everyone does because not everyone is able to be mindful enough mm -hmm. and really be in tune with their thoughts, beliefs, and emotions mm -hmm. and realize how those negative and self-defeating beliefs are causing the mental prisons and causing them to engage in dysfunctional behaviors. Mm -hmm. And we see it a lot. Let's, I'll, I'll give you a common example that's really sad. Think about the number of women in this world that have been in abusive relationships mm -hmm. for 40, 50, or 60 or more years. 
So here's somebody who's been in this mental prison for a lifetime and never escaped from it. Mm -hmm. The mental, emotional, or physical abuse mm -hmm. resulted in a situation in which the relationship, the marriage, was the mental prison. Mm -hmm. And that's very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. We see a lot of people... I just read a statistic that around 70% of people in the U.S. are overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. There's many people in that mental prison of physical neglect. Mm -hmm. And this, the strange thing is that we spend so much money on diets and exercise. Mm -hmm. And most of those diets fail. Over 90% of the people that start the diets fail. But we don't address the mental prisons that cause people to overeat. The shame. Right. The self-loathing. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I don't think everyone will escape from their mental prisons because they're not even aware that they're in them, mm -hmm. or they're so ingrained that they don't they don't believe that they can reach higher, or they even deserve to to be more successful or be at a better place in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. You touched on a lot of a lot of uh, topics right there. Um, so the, the belief of deservingness, right? Um, I mean, that's a piece, right? And that leads to a self-fulfilling prophecy phenomenon mm -hmm. where if you don't, if you feel like you don't deserve better treatment from others, then you're likely to stay in a relationship that's not healthy, right? Um, it's sort of this, almost this internal barometer uh, measure of like, okay, well, what am I capable of or what do I deserve? Um, and that benchmark is somewhere in here internally, Right? right, I come across this a lot in reading reading um, books about wealth and going to wealth seminars. Even, right, is that like people have this internal idea deep down of like what level of income they're supposed to be at, and you give them a golden opportunity to double their income, and they they mess it up because or they go up to that level, but then they come back down, right? Or like lottery winners who you know become instant millionaires, but then pretty soon spend all the money and they're back to their baseline level of right. like net worth. Um, it's like this internal, um, I've done a lot of videos on homeostasis and um, you know, obviously there's physiological homeostasis where you know, our bodies are constantly regulating temperature in a narrow window, uh, our blood sugar levels, keeping them in a narrow window, right? There's physiological homeostasis, but there's also, I think, in a form of like emotional homeostasis where it's like, you know, what, uh, what condition I'm, in life am I like supposed to be in and so there's this concept of uh, inertia I'm all about like applying like physics principles right because I was very good at physics and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain psychology in a very analytical way like almost like the way that you would explain physics and mechanics right so if we're going to be talking about like something like inertia you know inertia and momentum right somebody's in in this mental prison right they've got a lot of inertia there you know and to move an object at rest you need to apply a force right and it's like where is that force going to come from if they're if they're going to move from one situation or one um you know rung of the ladder you know in, in life and then they're going to move upwards into a different level and, and evolve there must be some sort of force so um i mean for you uh it sounds like you you used that anger uh in a way to kind of to to push yourself for use that as your force right so maybe we can conclude with you know um, for anyone watching this who might be uh, in their own mental prison right now right and if by watching this video I'm sure they're going to start realizing or asking themselves like maybe I am in a mental prison right now and start to, to think about that and be a little more mindful of the emotions right what advice would you give as their next step to uh, to as they as they become aware of this mental prison, to have the courage to venture forth and to to try something new. Like what what would be a practical advice uh, tip that you would give them? Fantastic question. Step number one, of course, would be to acknowledge that you're in that mental prison. Mm -hmm. As we've been discussing, it's so hard for people to see, for many people to see that they're in these mental prisons because they've been so ingrained in their minds all this time. Mm -hmm. The first thing I would say is be mindful, mm -hmm. is relax and be conscious of your emotions, your thoughts, and your beliefs and how they affect your life. Mm -hmm. And when, Because when you reach that state of consciousness and you're totally mindful 
and you can see that certain thoughts and beliefs cause you to do dysfunctional things. You know, for example, I'm not, I've been following my diet the last year and a half, and wow, I just gained 35 pounds. I have to be conscious of that before I can right. do something about it. If a lot of people are telling me that I'm rubbing in the wrong way, or I'm having bad relationships with my coworkers and family members mm -hmm. and friends, there's a good chance that there's a mental prison there. You know, maybe it's poor communication, maybe it's selfishness on my part, but I have to be mindful enough to see that those thoughts and beliefs that are making me act a certain way are rubbing people the wrong way yeah. and the resultant in dysfunctional behavior. Mm. So step two, I would say, is really look at how these mental prisons are affecting your life. Mm -hmm. Once you realize, for example, hey, I've been neglecting my diet, I gained 35 pounds, I need to do something about it. Ask yourself, how's my life gonna look if I stay in this mental prison? Mm -hmm. If I keep neglecting my diet and my physical health, mm -hmm. how am I gonna be in 10 or 20 years? Mm -hmm. Then ask yourself, if I got out of that mental prison, what could I achieve? Mm -hmm. How would I be? If I was lighter, if I was going to the gym and watching my diet, and then every once in a while I get to splurge. How would my life look? What other activities would I be able to do? How much more self-confidence would I have? Next step, I would say realize that those prisons are in your mind, but the power to change is also in your mind. Our minds mm -hmm. created these prisons, mm -hmm. and it's our minds that will set us free. Mm -hmm. And finally, just take that step out of the mental prison requires a lot of work, but it's not as hard as many people think. Mm -hmm. now, how many times have you feared doing something? How many times have you been really afraid to do something, but when you did it, you realized that there was absolutely nothing to fear to begin with? Mm -hmm. And that's most people. We're afraid to fail. We're afraid to take that leap. Mm -hmm. We don't believe that we can change. We get stuck in this limited mindset. Mm -hmm. When really, once we get out of those mental prisons, our possibilities are in abundance and they're limited. Yeah. You know, as, as I'm listening to you describe this, you know, how you think about it, the, the question that comes to mind for me is, or, or as the triggering question that anyone could ask themselves to, to get out of that prison is, would be this question. What is something that I'm doing or what's a habit that I'm following that is contributing to the problem that I'm having. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that, that there is the key that unlocks it, I think. Absolutely. Um, uh, in, in the line of work that I've been doing eight years in social services, what I've seen is that the, the clients that struggle the most, that, that make the least progress, they always do what's, what's called um, sometimes externalizing, meaning you say, well, why didn't you make it to, uh, to see your probation officer? Oh, well, you know, I was on my way and then you know, my family member called me and, uh, you know, they, they made me upset and, you know, because they, they always call me at the wrong time and that's why I had to get off the bus and, blah, 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 right? But it's, it's not like I made this bad decision to not follow through and with the meeting time where I didn't wake up early enough, it was, you know, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't wake me up on time. It's always other people. So it's that ability to like look internally, I think. And, and, uh, yeah, like I said, you say, what, 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 how am I contributing? What am I doing that could be contributing to this problem? So Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just started a book called Extreme Ownership. By oh, yeah. The Navy SEAL Jocko, book. Yeah, exactly. Jocko Willink, yeah. And that is really a big theme mm -hmm. in that book, which is we have to take ownership of our lives. Mm -hmm. And taking ownership, as you were saying, starts with just accountability. Mm -hmm. Saying the things that happen in my life are up to me. I, I can't keep blaming other people. I have to take ownership of my thoughts, of my feelings, of my beliefs. And when I see that there's something that I'm not doing right, I have to be willing to change it. Right. That's a great point. And I do see a lot of people in my life and business coaching practice that don't do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. That's a giant takeaway for, for everybody. So. All right, well, thank you to those watching. Thank you again to Charles for your time and for sharing your, you know, your valuable insights and experience. Um, if the viewers want to, um, to get in touch with you or to follow your, um, you know, your, 
content, uh, how can they reach you? Sure. The best way to reach me is at my website, mm -hmm. charlesamamia.com. That's charles, A-M-E-M-I-Y-A.com. Okay. Or hit me up on Facebook at Charles Amamia, A-M-E-M-I-Y-A.com. Mm -hmm. Or connect with me on LinkedIn, Charles Amamia. Awesome. And I'll put a link to your website in the uh, Great. description. Great. So. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you for watching. Think deeply and put your existence first. Thank you.